Our Father and God, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who's here. Pray for those who may still be on their way, Lord. Pray for safety and just uh, pray for your work in our lives today. May you be glorified. May you teach us. May you strengthen us. May you give us wisdom, Lord, and help us to understand the world in which we live and how to reach each individual for Christ. So, Father, we commit our time to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, uh, today I am beginning a six-part series that I've titled Being Exclusivistic in a Syncretistic World. I know that's a mouthful. I know that's a mouthful. Uh, Today is part one, the exclusive context. Now, I will define these words. I kind of made this word up, by the way. You know, we know what the word, I wanted it to rhyme, you know, so that's the best I could do. (laughs) Now, when you look at the world today, we recognize there's a lot of things taking place, a lot of things going on, not just in this country, but worldwide. And... What we're going to do in this series is explore some of these things, but also look at Acts 17. So if you have your Bibles or your phones or your tablets, go ahead and turn or click to Acts 17. We'll get there in just a few minutes. But this is the world in which we live, and I want us to look at the exclusive context of that chapter today. We'll read some of the verses, not all of them. But remember in the Old Testament, Israel was called by God to be separate from the world. Right? That's what the part of the purpose of the law was for. They had a different diet. They had a different God, a different system of sacrifices. They also had different scripture and different purpose in the world that God had called them to. But sadly, throughout their history, they didn't follow what the Lord wanted them to do. They incorporated many pagan beliefs, many pagan practices and ideas and more and philosophy into their worship of the true and living God. We even see it with the golden calf incident at Mount Sinai. They were supposed to belong exclusively to God, but they turned away. They became inclusive rather than exclusive. Hey, let's bring in all these practices of the world, of the Philistines, of of all these, you know, all these pagan deities, and let's just, you know, kind of incorporate them into our own worship service. Today, the world is increasingly becoming more inclusive as we speak, rather than exclusive. And they're fusing everything together, saying, well, everything is equal, except for Christianity. So there's always a contradiction and hypocrisy there whenever someone says that. We see things like this on bumper stickers. Coexist, respect. But you start talking to some of these people and you, they, you just talk about the exclusive claims of Christ. Oh, no, 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 no. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought we're supposed to coexist and respect one another. That's not the case. It's a facade. Spiritually, Beliefs, practices, uh, philosophies are being merged together, being grouped together all around the world. And unfortunately, the church has included a lot of unbiblical and even pagan practices within it over the years. We have incorporated into our worship, into what we believe, what we do, what we think, the philosophy, the worldview that we have. But God has also called us, the body of Christ, to be separate from the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. We are to be exclusivistic in a syncretistic world. So we have to ask the question, what does exclusive mean or exclusivistic? What does that actually mean? Well, it means this in summary. There is only one thing and nothing else. Exclusive. You know, when somebody gets married, they're exclusively for their spouse and no one else. You know, when you use your toothbrush, that toothbrush is exclusively yours, right? (laughs) We, We hope so. You know, so, you know, we live in an exclusive world too. But when it comes to religious ideas and everything too, we have to recognize there's only one truth and that comes from the word of God. And there is truth, truth does exist. And anything that contradicts that truth is called a lie. It's called false. And we need to understand that in our world. Now, syncretistic, on the other hand, 
means combining various things together. We'll take a little bit of this, a little bit, you know, like a buffet. You know, I like buffets. I don't know about you guys, but it's fun to go to buffets. And you can eat all you want, you know. <laughs> you know, but that's the world today when it comes to the ideology as well. And I've got a picture here. Think of maybe soup. You know, there's a lot of stuff in soup. Or like beef stew, perhaps. You got your meat, got your noodles, got your spices, got some uh, cilantro and onions and potatoes and this and that. You just kind of all merge together to eat. A lot of stuff put together. Now, it's good for food, but when it comes to life, it can be very destructive. It can be very de deadly. It can be spiritually deadly having eternal consequences. That was the world Paul lived in too. And it's the world that we live in today. So we think of what's going on. We see how politics and education, morality or lack thereof, religion are all becoming increasingly syncretistic or combined together with other beliefs, other philosophies, other ideas. And, you know, maybe you've heard the uh, phrase regarding uh, religious circles. Well, we all worship the same God. How many of you have ever heard that? Yeah, yeah. You know, Christianity, Islam, you know, even some of the prayers of the political leaders. Oh, God, by many names. Amen and a woman. I mean, hello. That's the world we live in. And we see it being played out before our very eyes. Well, truth says otherwise. And truth is really what unites Christians together. Not feelings, not experience, but truth. And again, anything contrary to that truth is false. And we live in a world full of conflicting worldviews. Worldviews. Now, what is that? Well, they're kind of like a pair of glasses. A pair of glasses. Or you could say sunglasses. A worldview is a perspective that we have of everything in history and in life. It's how we view things. The lens through which we look at life, problems, money, relationships, politics, everything. And, and you know what? Everybody has one. Everyone has a worldview, whether it's good or bad. And everything someone looks at, they look at through these lenses, through this worldview that they have. Now, the world bases their worldview or view of life on the world on what they see, what they feel, what they want, what they think, on the material things around us. In contrast to that, a biblical worldview is based on what? The Bible. It's based on the Word of God. God's Word. That's why we call it a biblical or Christian worldview. And in this series, we're going to look at Acts 17 and look at some worldview issues and, and much, much more. And today, we're going to, like I said, we're going to look at the context because we as Christians are to look at the Bible and base our doctrine, our thinking, our framework to determine our decisions by on what it says rather than what we want, what we feel, or what the world says, or what's popular, or what's politically correct. So we'll look at Acts 17. We're going to see how Paul dealt with it then and make some application how we can deal with these things today. So we're going to talk about religion and philosophy where we are today, so I'm going to make you think in this series. So I hope you're ready to think. You ready to think? I know it's kind of early still. You got your coffee, maybe got your tea. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> but I want to strengthen your faith and stimulate your mind in this series. Now, I've got a quick outline here I want to show you because when we think about this again, we want to look at God's Word and have our thinking based on that in every area of our life. So, let's start with what the context is here. So, number one, the exclusive context. This is just going to be a summary of the chapter, which is the one we're doing now. Then we will look at the exclusive truth, verses 1 through 9. The third one will be the exclusive word, verses 10 through 15. Then the exclusive message will be message number 4, verses 16 through 21. And then we will explore specifically an exclusive worldview, part 1, and verses 22 through 31. We'll look at religion, the exclusive God that Paul proclaims here. We'll see how he says God is the creator, the sustainer, the savior, and the adjudicator or judge. Those are the four main things that he talks about God's character in this chapter. 
to pagans who do not know God. Then uh, the last one's gonna be the exclusive worldview part two. That's verses 22 through 34. We'll look at creation, we'll look at humanity, salvation, judgment, and of course, resurrection. So we're gonna look at these things in this context and we're gonna compare it to our world and also we're gonna address a little bit about evangelizing in our world today, because we need to do so. Now, verses one through nine in Acts chapter 17. I've got a map here. This is the Ignatian Way and it's a road, you can see right here, one of the major roads in ancient Rome. Went to some of the major cities and this is the road that Paul and uh, Silas around AD 50 were traveling and they end up in Thessalonica right here. So here they are and of course what do they do? Well the verses tell us. We will read verses uh, 1 and 2 real quick here. Now when they traveled through Amphilopolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the scriptures. So three weeks, three Sabbaths. He was there proclaiming scripture to them. And he was talking about Jesus, the Messiah, how he had to suffer and die. And the result was this, there were some Jews and many Gentiles who believed. There were some who believed. Now, we also read in the text, there were other Jews that were jealous. And what did they do? They stirred up the city. A mob then goes to Jason's house to bring out Paul and the others, and they arrive, and they, well, where they go? They're not here. Where are they? Now, Jason and more, of course, were brought to the authorities, and they said, well, you know, these men have turned the world upside down, and they have come here also. How would you like to be known for that? Amen. That'd be pretty cool but you'd have to be ready to be hunted down like this too. And there are Christians, by the way, around the world today who are being just as faithful and being hunted down. We need to remember that. They said, uh, you know, Jason has received them. They went against Caesar saying, well, there's another king, and who would that be? Jesus, Jesus. The people, the city authorities were bothered. Jason gives them money as a promise that there would be no further problems. And this is, probably why Paul left and was not able to go back to Thessalonica. We have no record of him ever going back. And he has something he references in 1 Thessalonians 2.18. I want to come back to you, but Satan hindered us. So he may have been referring to this event here in Acts 17. But this is kind of the first step here. And I just want to give you an overview here of his second missionary journey. We have three recorded, some say a fourth as well, but this was a long trip before planes, before cars, before motorcycles. <laughs> and you think about it, he started here in Antioch. Here's the, the uh, Ignatian Way over here, down through here, here's Athens, over the road over here, do, 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 all the way back here to Jerusalem, then back up to Damascus, then back up to Antioch. That's a long trip. You know, no lockdowns here, he had to worry about, thankfully. But this was a, his second missionary trip from Acts 15 to Acts 18. And we're kind of in the middle of that in Acts 17. But in 10 through 15, we see he's in Thessalonica. Again, this is up here, I hope you guys can see that, but it's right there. And that's where all these things occurred. That's where the situation happened. And Paul and Silas were sent away by night to Berea, which is just a little further south. You can see it right here. Maybe, you know, 30 miles or so, not too far. And those there received the word with all eagerness. Let's look at verse 11 real quick here. Look at verse 11, Acts 17, verse 11. Of course, they went to the synagogue of the Jews, verse 10. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Wow. They were testing what the apostle Paul was teaching. How much more do we need to test what we hear by what the Word of God says. And Paul commends them for it. He wasn't like, oh, how could you? I'm an apostle. No, these guys are smart. These guys are testing what I say by what the scriptures say. Again, we need to do the same. That's an aside, that one's for free. But they come here and Jews from Thessalonica find out what they're doing there in Berea. So what do they do? Well, they send some folks down there, they send some people down there, and uh, you know, they try to stir up some things down there too. 
Unfortunately, Paul was sent away. Silas and Timothy stayed there, and those who took Paul went as far as Athens. So you see, this is not a short trip here. Up in Berea, do, 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 do. of course, they went, to the, they went by sea down here, down to Athens. You know, when, when we think of the locations of the events of Scripture, don't forget, I mean, these were real people, real life, walking, you know, maybe in a caravan or whatever. This is a long trip. This is not something you can do, you know, in a few, few hours. This would have taken days for them to do this. So they went down to Athens, and of course, you know, Silas and Timothy were requested to meet Paul soon, and they did later. But then something happens while Paul is in Athens. Look at verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them, that is uh, Timothy and Silas, at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city was full of idols. Here's a picture of ancient Athens. Very prominent city, of course, in Greece. And here's kind of a schematic picture of what the, uh, the Acropolis would have looked like. Of course, the Parthenon, we've all seen pictures of the Parthenon. And you can go to Tennessee and see kind of a mimic of that as well. But he was here. And he was deeply moved. He saw these numerous idols. Now, an ancient proverb actually says this. There were more gods in Athens than men. <laughs> if that gives you an idea. He goes to the synagogue. Then he goes to the marketplace. And he speaks with the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers of his day. They mocked him. Why? Because he preached Jesus in the resurrection. That's strange to us. Res resurrection, what is that? They say, well, this is, this is interesting. We want to hear a little bit more. So what do they do? Well, they take him up to the Areopagus, or Mars Hill. Now, of course, this is the Acropolis over here, and this is Mars Hill right here. It's basically a big stone thing where they would go in that day. You'll see another picture in a little bit. And they take him there, and this is where the, the natives and the visitors discuss something new all the time. <laughs> What does it mean? You know, what do these things mean? Now look at verses 22 and 23. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance this I proclaim to you. And this is a picture of an altar to an unknown God. You know, whether this was the same one, we don't know, but there were, there were multiple ones like this throughout the, the empire. Because the, <laughs> those who are superstitious don't want to miss anybody. <laughs> you know? Just in case we forgot one God somewhere, well, here it is. You know? And this, of course, is what Paul's referring to. And there could have been many of these. We don't know. And then he goes up and proclaims the gospel. What does he do? Well, in these verses, 22 through 31, he speaks of the creator of heaven and earth. He doesn't need anything, and he's in control of everything. He doesn't need these temples. He's self-sustaining. And he, here he says, you know, people are to seek him. And then he quotes two Greek poets, of which they would have known. He says, God's not like the idols you are worshiping. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He's the creator. He doesn't need these things. And that's a good challenge and reminder for us, by the way. You know, sometimes we think, well, God needs me to do this. God needs me to do it. No, he doesn't. He is fully self-sustaining, but he gives us the opportunity, the blessing, and yes, the responsibility to partner with him and do what he's doing around the world. That's part of the beauty of the Christian life. So Paul says, you know, you know these, this, these gods are not, the, the true and living God are not like the gods you guys are worshiping. The same God is patient now, but he commands everyone everywhere to do what? Repent. Why? Because he is the judge and he has set a point where someone will judge and he's proven this by raising him from the dead. And he preached Jesus and the resurrection. Hmm. Now, verses 32 through 34. 
when he spoke of the resurrection, some mocked. <laughs> resurrection? Coming back to life? Seriously? Are you deluded? Do you have something wrong in your brain, Mr. Paul? Some wanted to hear more. Now this could have been, that's very interesting. I, I would like to really hear more about that. Or, this is new. I want to hear more. But there were some who believed. And we see their names given at the end of the chapter in verse 34. So some mocked, some wanted to hear more, some believed. This is a basic three-part result of sharing Christ with anyone. When we share the gospel, somebody is going to mock you. Somebody's going to tell you, I can't believe you believe that. Others are going to be like, well, that's interesting. You know, maybe the Lord's touched their heart. Maybe, maybe they've grown up in a religious circle or something like that. They've never really heard the gospel before, and they truly want to hear more. And then others are already prepared, and they say, oh, yes, I believe. It just depends. We can't control that. And by the way, Acts 17 is probably a summary of what Paul was actually teaching, because you can read this in just a few minutes. But this is Mars Hill, the Areopagus, a fairly big place. Now, I've never been here. Who's been here? I, heard, you know, I would love to go here, because you can see they have the plaque there you know, of Acts 17, as you can read. Now, there may have been a platform and some stuff up on here, but <clears throat> this is what it looks like today. Now, we need to recognize, just kind of get a little bit, give the, the context here of Athens. The glory of Athens had passed. Long gone. Rome is now ruling. They took over. The idols and the gods and goddesses still abounded here in Athens. And I've got a quote here from uh, A.T. Robertson from his Word Pictures in the New Testament, and it says this, quote, In its agora, Socrates had taught. Here was the Academy of Plato, the Lyceum of Aristotle, the Porch of Zeno, the Garden of Epicurus. Here, men still talked about philosophy, poetry, politics, religion, anything and everything. It was the art center of the world. The Parthenon, the most beautiful of temples, crowned the Acropolis. Was Paul insensible to all this cultural environment? It's hard to think so, for he was a university man of Tarsus, and he made a number of allusions to Greek writers. Again, he quoted two Greek writers. Probably it had not been Paul's original plan to evangelize Athens, difficult as university seats are, and that is true. But he cannot be idle, though here apparently by chance, quote unquote, because driven out of Macedonia, unquote. And uh, this is the, the classic painting by Raphael, of, you know, 1515, 1516 of, of Paul on Mars Hill. Mars Hill, by the way, was named for the Roman god of war, Mars. And people gather here again to discuss everything. Basically, this was the university coffee shop of the day. You know. Two groups often met here, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Well, who were the Epicureans? Let's look at that just a little bit here. The Epicureans were very materialistic, very materialistic. They believed that the gods were physical, but they were not involved in life. And you see this in, of course, Greek mythology. These individuals, this group, was powerless to do anything about evil. They're these, rather, these, the, the gods they believed were powerless to do anything about evil. And they did not create the universe. They focused on personal pleasure, uh, physical and mental, and they believed in free will. Friendship, which I find interesting, was emphasized. And they were also very knowledge-based. Uh, knowledge was important. And they had an escapist attitude to pain, very similar to some of the Eastern philosophies. They were atheists, and they also based a lot of their ideas on evolution. Not the evolution that we think of today, but an evolutionary idea. Of course, many scientists, many universities have this evolutionary idea, and unfortunately, some seminaries, too, have the same idea. Now, Stoics, they were a little bit different. They believed errors in judgment led to destructive emotions. They viewed their philosophy as a way of life. Uh, virtue was the only way to be happy and to be free. <clears throat> they were very logical. 
you know, very, you know, systematic, you could say. They wanted to control their emotions. Do we have any Star Trek fans here? Any Star Trek fans? Vulcans, you know the word Vulcan? Yeah, that's kind of similar to how they, they viewed things. They believed that knowledge was attained by reason. So they were rationalistic, rationalism. They also believed that the universe was God or nature and that was contained in two physical substances, active and passive. This is kind of interesting. The active was fate or universal reason acting in a passive way. You say, what in the world does that mean? You have to ask a Stoic. <laughs> but passive was matter, was physical. You know, your, your cup, your Bible, your, your shoes, your glasses, whatever. These guys were pantheistic, like New Age. Everything was God. They also believed in evolution. So we see a starting point for each one of them, the natural world, the natural world. So we see these two groups, within these two groups, we see the merging of things, the physical, the spiritual, how these things were syncretized together. In addition, just as a reminder, I'm sure most of you know, the Roman gods were basically Greek gods with different names. That's what Rome did. Zeus was Jupiter. Ares, the Greek god of war, again, was Mars, Mars Hill. Basically, Rome didn't care what you believed as long as your allegiance was to Rome. Now, in our world today, there are a lot of different philosophies. I've got a few of them here. Secularism, what is that? Well, that also focuses on this world apart from God. There's humanism. That is, by our own strength, we can change ourselves. Hey, just throw more money at it. You can fix yourself. Blame somebody else. You know, this humanism basically focuses on the world, again, our lives. And you combine both secular and humanism, and what do you have? Secular humanism. That's, again, part of the philosophy that we are living in today. And that is based on naturalism or evolutionary ideas. All there is is the physical. The spiritual doesn't exist. Only what I can see, only what I can touch. Naturalism is a faith that says God did not create us, but we evolved by a natural process. And most of the science that your kids and grandkids are learning today is based on evolutionary thought. In secular schools, in some, quote, Christian schools, and again, some seminaries and more. This, again, is the world we live in. Then there's modernism. Now, modernism began with the Industrial Revolution some years ago. That, the idea that uh, science is the answer. Science can change the world. Now, science is good, but it can't fix our problems. Mm. Now, as a reaction to the failure of modernism, postmodernism arose. That's the idea, well, there's no such thing as truth related to relativism, which I've also listed here. Uh, no objective absolutes. We do what we feel is right. I feel this. Yeah, if you talk to somebody for any period of time, I feel this, I feel that. Well, I feel, well, oh, I'm, I'm glad you have feelings, but you can't base your life on that. Otherwise, you're really in trouble. Now, defining postmodernism is kind of like trying to nail jello to a wall <laughs> because it's just so, you know, strange and, you know, changes and stuff like that. And, of course, there are more religions than we can count in the world today, more cults, too, more false ideas. And in our world, again, there is this desire to merge all of these things together, to syncretize them together. Politics, business, finances, religions. And in part, it's based upon what is known as tolerance and pluralism. Now, I want to define these a little bit more. Tolerance used to mean, well, if we disagree with something, I can still respect you as a human being. Not so anymore. Today, if you disagree with me, oh, oh, you're attacking me. Oh, this is the snowflake mentality. This is the victim mentality. If you disagree with my view on 
fill in the blank, then you hate me. You're attacking me. You don't like me. Oh, woe is me. And that's part of the mindset that a lot of people have today. Pluralism says, well, let's set aside our differences and come together for the betterment of humanity. Because, you know, we're, we're all connected, we're all related in some way, shape, or form. All religion has, you know, the truth in it. So let's just bring that together. You know, don't worry about those minor things like, you know, heaven, hell, grace, faith, Jesus himself. Don't worry about those things. Let's just come together and, and help each other. And we can fix our problems. And then, of course, Marxism and socialism have just erupted into the common thought of our world today, too. And again, this is the world that we live in. And I haven't even mentioned the environmentalist movements, which are also connected to Marxism and socialism, by the way, too, a lot of times. And now we've moved beyond postmodernism to what I would call meism. <laughs> That's just kind of my, my word. What is that? Everything revolves around me. Me. Now, we may say there's a group mentality, but it really is about me. It's all about what I want, what I think. Uh, my desires, my goals, et cetera, et cetera. Here's a few examples. Some say, well, religion doesn't help anybody. Others say, well, truth doesn't exist. Well, I've got my truth. You've got your truth. Don't tell me I'm wrong <laughs> because I want us to coexist. So if you tell me I'm wrong, we can't coexist. Why do you constantly hear people saying, don't tell me I'm wrong? Well, because that brings quote, disunity, and we're trying to achieve unity. One world government, one world religion, that's where we're headed. This is all a part of that. And even in the church, there's this call to unite. Well, let's set aside our differences, let's set aside our doctrines, and work together. Now, there are many secondary matters which we can disagree on, but when we set aside the Bible, set aside core doctrines of the faith, set aside truth, set aside scripture, set aside salvation by grace, and set aside all those other things, that's not of God. That's of the world. And we are in a worldview battle today. Even uh, some popular political leaders hold to false religion. Well, how many politicians say, yes, I'm a Christian or I believe in God? And then you look at their politics and you're like, wait a second, that is completely contrary to what scripture says. And there are others who hold to a new age idea. And there are some, quote, Christian leaders. Well, we need to, to partner with these pagans so we can fix our problem, fix our nation. And these, quote, church leaders, well, and you may have heard this. This is something that really began with the emergent church some years ago. Well, it's arrogant to say we can know something for sure, to really say this is truth. You can't say that because we really don't know. It could be this, it could be that progressivism. You can't say somebody's wrong. That's, that's, that's not nice. That's bigotry. Ooh. But they can tell you you're wrong. How does that work? And here's the rub. Here's, here's the main thing. We live in a world where people say we must accept everything and everyone except biblical Christianity. That's what it, now, this is not a victim mentality for us. This is just the reality we live in. And we need to be aware of this when we're talking to our family, to our friends, to our, uh, those we know, those that we love, when it comes to the things of the Word of God. Because this is how the world thinks. And it's only going to become more prominent as time goes by. And historically, in first century Rome, every religion was accepted except for Christianity. Originally, Christianity was viewed as a sect or a group of Judaism that broke off from there. But Christians were persecuted. Why is that? Well, true Christians would not bow to Caesar as Lord. You could follow any belief you wanted, anything. But you were required to take a pinch of salt one time a year. Go to a specific place, a specific temple near where you live, drop it in, and say, Kaiser Curios, Caesar is Lord. And guess what happened? Christians said, no. We will not do this. And they became targets of Rome. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Paul said this, Therefore, 
I want you to understand that no one is speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Because to say Jesus is Lord was a death sentence in first century Rome. And it is the same way today again in many places around the world. So, here's a few applications. Number one, what do we do? What do we do? We just looked at the, the historical context of Acts 17, made some application. Here's a few things. First of all, recognize that this will occur sooner or later in this country. There will be a merging of different ideas, and we're seeing that play out right before our eyes. Religion, government, all this stuff is happening. And here's the question, will we bow before government or bow before God? Yes, God ordained government, whatever type it is. And there are Christians around the world who struggle with this. But when the government, and I, when I say that, I mean the leadership within that institution, because they're human beings too, tell us to do something God forbids or forbid us from doing something God commands, we must obey God rather than man. And this kind of speech is going to cause a lot of problems in our near future. And we need to be prepared. We must do this humbly, lovingly, boldly, respectfully, just like Daniel and his friends did during their time. So that's first. Second, we need to understand the culture in which we live. That's why we're doing this. That's why I'm talking about these things. In Paul's time, Jews knew at least some of the Old Testament and their history. A lot more than we realize. There were some who were waiting for the Messiah. Others enjoyed the Hellenistic Greek style life of the day. And Paul talked to them based upon what they knew, where they were. But his approach to the Gentiles, these philosophers, was very different. Why is that? Well, aside from the fact that Gentiles are not required to obey the law, these guys had no background in the Old Testament. Zero. The resurrection? What are you talking about? What does that mean? Huh? <laughs> On Mars Hill, these philosophers had no clue about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had no concept of the Jewish scriptures. Their philosophy, their religion was contrary to God. In fact, some of their ideas were against a God being involved in life. So to hear that a God has intervened in real life, other than their mythology with Zeus and everything, gods don't do that. What are you talking about? I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Third, learn some various methods of evangelism. Roman's Road is always good. Evangelism Explosion, Way of the Master. And there's numerous ones out there you can learn. But we have to remember this. Each person is different. We need to deal with them as individuals just as Jesus did. Now for some, we go to the gospel directly. But for others, we need to start somewhere else. Like creation, like Paul did of course, without compromise. Now, here's another one. Here's another question. Though we live in a syncretistic world, we must hold to, proclaim, live, teach, preach, and never compromise the exclusive truth, the exclusive word of God, the exclusive gospel of grace, and the exclusive love that we hold to when it comes to the Lord. Is it easy? No. No, it's not. If we won't stand strong today, we will not stand strong tomorrow. So what did Paul do? What did Paul proclaim to each group? Now again, for the Jews who knew their scriptures, where does he start? With the scripture, with the Old Testament. He starts with their history. He proclaimed the truth about Christ. God had already prepared them. They already knew these things. Paul reasoned from the scriptures, the text says. His focus was scripture, and Jesus as the fulfillment of that scripture of the Old Testament. But for Gentiles, he had a different approach. Again, they had no foundation. He began where they were. As I was walking around, as I was walking about, I saw this altar to an unknown God. He began where they were. And though he began where the Jews were too, the Gentile audience was very different. He transitioned to the beginning. God exists, created all things. There's Genesis 1-1 right there. Of course, the Jews had that for centuries. 
Paul used the familiar as a starting point to declare the gospel, and that is something that we can also do too. I'll give you an example. Years ago, I went to Baltimore and uh, doing a video shoot up there. And I was eating lunch and there was a young lady sitting off to the side and she prayed before she ate. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I, I wanted to talk, I was like, Lord, what do I say, what do I, what do, I do? Um, and I was like, oh, okay, who did you pray to? And she told me, and it turns out it was completely not the God of the Bible. <laughs> uh, so I was able to talk to her, ask her some questions and share the gospel with her. You know, so, I mean, these kinds of things can, can happen. But in our everyday life, how do we do this? How do we do this? Here's a few things. As we follow Paul's example, we have to know what Scripture says. We have to know the Word of God. We have to understand the times, like the sons of Issachar. We have to know some history, too, and recognize there's different ways to reach others for Christ. You know, one size does not fit all when you're talking to somebody about Jesus. We must learn more than what just the scripture says. Now, yes, we start with the scripture. But years ago, you could say, the Bible says, and people listen, and they take you seriously. Not so anymore. That is not the world we live in anymore. We must say the Bible says, yes. But we must also recognize the foundation of our world, and the culture is very, very different today. Here's another one. Learn about the culture. Learn about the beliefs that some other people have. It takes time. Recognize, you know, what somebody believes regarding Islam, Hinduism. Different, quote, versions of Christianity that are not Christian. Cults. If you tell a Muslim Jesus is the Son of God, they have a very different view of that than we do. Define your terms. Start with Scripture, use what is available, transition to Scripture and the Gospel. For those who do hold a different worldview, preach the truth, but also be aware of what they believe. Recognize these things. Understand these things. Now, real quick before we finish up, there are some pastors who I've actually heard, I've actually heard them say, Paul failed in Athens. How many of you have ever heard that before? They say he blew it in Athens. He did not do a good job in Athens. I've actually heard pastors teach that. I see some heads nodding, yeah. That is not the case. This is a wonderful illustration of reality. His audience was two different groups, the Jews and the pagan philosophers. Paul knew about their culture. He knew about their history. And when he preached Christ, they said, wait a second. This is new. We haven't heard this before. Some laughed, some wanted to hear more, and then some believed. And some missionaries work very hard for years before they see their first convert. So for those who support missionaries, recognize that. And having living, lived in Japan for two years, it's a completely different culture. Completely different mindset. I can go in there and say the word of God says, and they, have, they would have no clue what I was talking about. So I understand part of what Paul went through here. We recognize these things are in his hands, but when we go somewhere we're to speak and get to the point where we can share the gospel and to be faithful, that's what he requires of us. So as we finish up, Paul went to Athens, he went to the philosophers, he spoke to the Jews, he preached Christ. Having been deeply provoked in his heart to speak, he used different methods, but here's a question. Are we moved by the idols in our world? Are we moved by the idols in our culture? It could be literal idols or it could be mental idols. It could be religious philosophies. It could be power. It could be money. Whatever the case is. People worship any number of things. Will we proclaim the truth? But here's another question. What are the idols in our lives? Are there any? What do we worship? Where does our money go? What do we spend most of our time with? Is it work, education, family, kids can become an idol? Achievements, material possessions, spirituality, politics, or is it Jesus? Yes, all these things are important. They have their place. We understand that. 
But if the Lord is not the center, they can easily become idols. And while there are a variety of worldviews today, there's actually really only two. A biblical worldview that starts with God's truth because all others start with man's opinion. Let's pray. Our Father and God, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for just getting the exclusive context and an overview of this wonderful chapter, Lord. So challenge us to understand the world in which we live, the culture in which we live, and give us the ability and opportunity and the way to equip ourselves to better share Jesus with those that we love, with our neighbors, with our family, and with our friends. So Father, now we commit our time to you. We thank you, we love you, and we look forward to what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-888. 7819466 Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.